Good evening, viewers. Welcome to the 26th episode of Dr. Kamni Rao's Masterclass. What a beautiful journey it has been to this blissful episode. Thank you, viewers. I am overwhelmed with your support. This pandemic has been testing the resilience of people around the world. All these obstacles and hardships are a test of our strength and weakness, courage and faith. Very soon, together, we shall overcome this crisis. A few days back, I asked a doctor how to preserve a sense of work-life balance. And he said, maintain your hobbies. Yes, viewers, doctors don't live by medicine alone. They too have interests, passion and pastimes outside of medicine and that is engaging and satisfying. Having said that, I have a very unique guest with us for today. He has found ways to maintain his wildlife photography and a way to unwind himself and keep going. Wildlife photography and surgery? Doctor, are you confusing us with something? No, dear friends, I thought myself, they are all intertwined. You think doctors can't do surgery and do wildlife? Of course they can do. They can shoot pictures. They don't shoot with a gun, they shoot with a camera. And yes, he is also an avid cricketer as well. Who could we be talking about? A person who's done over two and a half thousand kidney transplants. He's been almost the first in our state. A whole lot of kidney transplants and has been known to have the highest success rates. And he is none other than Dr. Ajit Huilgol. You are going to currently see that this person who is known as a kidney transplant to you and you have known him well but I am going to give him a 360 degrees Ajit, Ajit and Ajit. So you are now not only going to see a person who is a consultant nephrology and transplant surgeon at Columbia Asia Hospital Hebal. So viewers I am going to introduce you. Welcome Dr. Ajit Hulgur. Thank it's you. A Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to have you on my show. It's an honor to be here, really. Thank you very More much. More than a pleasure. It's an honor. Because for me, Ajit, I have known you for a long time, and I'm sure you also agree with me that our relationship goes back to over 30 years. And perhaps it's more through your wife rather than directly with you. But I keep saying all, that I'm, I'm, I'm known as Mr. Medha. <laughs> because they know her far, far better than, than me. <laughs> and so, I, in fact, there were so many times and so many things that we used to talk. And I never realized that the first time I got to meet you was when I had to anesthetize a very important person. But that aside, I've always had, when I talked about you with a large number of your peer group, you came out to be a very principled person and a precision person. So principled, precision and very apolitical is what I would like to say. And that's what made you to be able to very patiently concentrate on these small objects called arteries and veins. And you were able to do a great job. You were able to talk to these things. And in fact, in surgery, this is one thing that we learn. Knife and needle is the only things that have to touch the tissues and not those big arteries and clamps, etc. So, like music to Mozart, it was Ajit to these vessels. And I feel that this is what you were able to talk to them, they listened to you, doesn't matter what size they were, you were able to get that kind of jugal bandi in, and that was the 99% success rates. And even plumbers with pipes couldn't do what you did to the kidneys. And this is something that I have always felt so nice about. So can you tell me how did your early days and how did you get into this kind of transplant? What really egged you on? I was not trained to be a transplant surgeon. Uh, I did my vascular surgery training in PGI Chandigarh. Came back to Bangalore, very happy doing my general surgery and my vascular surgery. 
And then right out of the blue, uh, Bangalore Kidney Foundation those days was looking around for someone to do transplants. And uh, Dr. Parmesh, who was uh, head of uh, Lakeside Hospital, I don't know what he had seen in me. Uh, I don't know that myself because you know he just rang up and said, I want you to come for a meeting. This meeting was in Century Club. I went there not knowing what it was about. And they said, we want to start doing transplants in, in Bangalore, in Karnataka. That was in 1982, December. Uh, and in 1983, May, we actually went about and did the first successful transplant in Karnataka. And I was then roped in because of my uh, skills with vascular surgery. So that you know, if there was any problem with uh, small blood vessels, multiple arteries, multiple veins and so on, uh, my skills would come in handy. So that's how I was roped into transplant. I was not a trained transplant surgeon, just a general surgeon. But then I felt the need to get a formal sort of a certificate. Uh, and I went back to my alma mater, I went back to PGI Chandigarh and worked there for a year and got this diploma in uh, transplant surgery. At that time, general surgeons were doing transplant surgery, not urologists, not in Chandigarh. And even now, PGI Chandigarh, only general surgeons with training in, in uh, transplant surgery do transplants, not urologists. Yeah, but then you took that special one-year fellowship mm -hmm. with the uh, vascular fellowship. Where yeah, you the did transplant. That, uh, yeah. Transplant, let's mm -hmm. say. But that fellowship is not there now in... Uh, Chandigarh at the moment, that one year fellowship. Yeah, they don't it? have that because now it's there is a field of abdominal transplantation where you're trained in doing not just kidney transplants but liver transplant and pancreas and so on. Those days there was no liver transplant at all. Absolutely. It was just uh, experimental and being done in one or two centers in the in the US and other places. And it was an experimental procedure. It was not licensed to be performed on human beings on a large scale. So it was only kidney transplants then. So, but then having done that, you didn't do the befores and afters. You didn't do the preparation of the patient or the immunosuppression after. Yeah. You just went and did the surgery and you said, enough, after that I'm not going to do. Why? I think, I think you need to know your limitations and also what you can, you can give to the patient. You can't be, you know, a master of everything. You're good at one thing, you stick to that. There are others who are good at what they do. The immunologists, the virologists, the nephrologists, the dialysis technicians, they all do their own jobs and they do it to the best possible you know, effect and, and extent that they can. So I don't think I should be meddling around and telling them what they should be doing or fine-tuning their medicines or, or going back to the lab and doing this and that unless there was something drastically wrong. So that's why so, you got into that cricket mania because that's also a team player. Yeah, it is a team it? player by, and then you know a batsman doesn't go and tell the bowler what he should be doing, Abs how should he should be bowling. Or, uh, so you, you do what you, you've been trained to do best. That's but it. then you are able to choose a good team and that's important. That is very important and you know and sometimes it sort of just clicks. Yeah. Uh, like it is with the Indian team now for example. Of course a lot of hard work goes in, a lot of planning goes in, a lot of behind the scenes work go, go on in that and then they all gel and then they come together. And then it is easy to build on that. But the initial years, you know, when you go back to the era of Pataudi and Jaisima and all these guys who played for the love of cricket. Love of cricket. Totally for the love of cricket. And that shone through. When they played, you could see it in the way they behaved, in the way they, you know, they, they spoke, gentleman's they walked. Gentleman's game. Gentleman's game. It was game. gentleman's game. You should see Jim Laker when he got yeah, 19 test wickets in, in, in one test match. He gets this guy out and... There's no screaming and jumping and shouting and running to the umpire and saying, oh, no, no, no. He just turned around, how's that? Very, very polite. And the umpire would say, yes, he's out. So, you know, that, the way it was played then, not for money. There was no money at all in, in, in cricket. Absolutely. So, and, and it came through. And so, when, as a commentator also, you related to that sort of a thing. That, that era was different. And that's what it, made you get into commentary as well. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Was not good enough to, be, to play for uh, the state or in India. This is the next best thing. <laughs> yeah. No, but the fact is you found your niche into everything, isn't it? But you mm -hmm. said that you didn't do anything in terms of befores and afters. Mm -hmm. But the cyclosporin that you actually found, it was very good, mm -hmm. post-surgery. That was something, was an innovation that was actually uh, sort of used by you. It was coming into India at that time. It wasn't there. And uh, before that was what I called the, I was trained in the BC era. BC doesn't mean before Christ. I mean, I might look that old, but uh, when I say BC era, I'm talking about before cyclosporin. And the okay. AC era is after cyclosporin. This miracle drug came in again at the right time. 
Good. When I was trained, we were using high doses dose of steroids, of steroids. Yes, right. and a drug called azathioprine yes, right. or imuran, which was the trade name yeah. at that time. And the complications were horrendous. But in a way, it is good because I knew what not to do or how to tackle it if there were such complications ever arose. So that again was good. And, and you take those lessons uh, from, from what you see in, in, in life as well, not just in surgery. So, and this drug came in. Steroids were not required in those high doses. In fact, people, certain centers went off steroids totally. No steroids at all after four or five days. So that is the transformation that this drug made. Before that, the success rate was about 65%. So if I did transplants on 100 people, only 65 would be alive at the end of one year. One year. One year oh success rate, so-called success rate was 65%. With cyclosporin, 90%, 90%. At the end of five years, 85%. At the end of 10 years, 65% are still alive and doing well. This, just one drug made that change in, in the that entire That must thing. have made you feel Yeah, because so the technique, see as a surgeon, the technique remains the same. That's Whether I take a kidney from a donkey or a pig or a monkey or a human being, it's same arteries and veins and ureter. The technique remains the same, but the medicines that came with that and made life easier for everybody concerned put transplantation on a, on, a, on, on a regular footing. It was not considered experimental, it wasn't considered dangerous, wasn't considered something too risky. You just walked in and got the transplant done and walked out. Yeah, but you can't make it that simple, Ajit. You know, you know <laughs> in your hands, fine. But you know, kidneys, all kidneys are not the same. Some have just one artery, some have three arteries. And you know, the anomalous arteries and you know, anomalously situated ureters and all that. And then the size of the ureters also matter between the donor and the recipients. So you have got to be prepared for everything. So it's not just simply anastomosing, but also the way you anastomose and the postoperative complications. Are there any kind of knots stuck in between and you can have, uh, you know, stones formations and all these kind of things. So there are a lot of, uh, you know, sort of delicate points which a very good surgeon knows and another surgeon uh, may not know. And you may say that, you know, all surgeons do the same thing, but it is not because success rates will depend upon that art and science that that person has and that you've proved beyond a doubt. And yet, because of that, government had asked you to go and set up centers everywhere and of course you've been called to other foreign countries to establish centers in Africa and all the other, um, you know, outside places. How does it feel going and setting things up and telling people how to do it? It's very, very difficult because a lot of politics then comes in. You're prepared to do it. It's easy to do it. There are surgeons there who are again well qualified, who are willing to, to learn. And from Nigeria, in fact, one surgeon and, and a nephrologist came down, spent six months with us and went back and they started their own center back in Nigeria. Uh, but in most other places, what I found is the politics then comes in. The local nephrologists don't want you, the local surgeons don't want you, other hospitals don't want you. And then it becomes very, very difficult, very, very messy. I went to Ethiopia, I did 45 AV fistulas, that is the, the surgery that is required before dialysis can be done. 45 surgeries totally free of charge. We took the entire thing from, from here. We took our kits, we took our needles, we took our you know, instruments, everything from India. Did it totally free. And what happened at the end of it? Nothing, nothing came of it. Did the same thing in Kenya. I went to, uh, to Nairobi. Then I went to a place called Eldoret, which is west, northwest of Nairobi. And to a place in between called Lake Naivasha. Again, free surgeries. On, which is a sort of a step towards doing transplantation, but that never came through again because of the local politics. So that is something that, you know, I can't handle at least. <laughs> so that's why I said you're very apolitical, that that's why it doesn't matter. Because if there's no, no gravy there, nobody's going to take it. Yep. You know? But uh, that is the reason why you did not stop and you didn't despair. You sort of see when a river is in flood, you can't stop it. Okay, and you're not actually, you know, drawn into politics because of this and you decided to sort of diversify your hobbies, you know, diversified and you went into wildlife photography. And I want to know, you know, in wildlife photography, I mean, that is a huge, you know, you have to have mountains of patience. Patience, yeah. Because, you know, you have to sit the whole day and that damn you animal, adopt, and you've got no what, control what over that animal. You have to adopt the pace of nature Absolutely. and the pace of nature is patience. You know? uh, unpredictable, so, totally yeah. unpredictable. Yeah. <laughs> Expect the unexpected. Yep, so absolutely. how did you manage to do it? Is that why 
Again, you know, that love for wildlife, I keep saying this, uh, even as a child, a newborn child, for example, has that love for nature and, uh, you know, plants and animals and birds, it's wired into our DNA. You place biscuits in the form of, say, rectangular biscuits like parley glucose or round ones like uh, Mari biscuit or biscuits in the shape of animals and birds, child invariably will go for those biscuits which are shaped like animals and birds. Because that is, that is within us. That's the reason why whenever you get some free time, you want to go off, whether it's to Kaban Park or Lal Bagh or whether it's near a river or whatever it is, because that is inside you. That cannot never be taken away from you. But when the child grows up, and you know, I'm, I'm sorry I keep saying this, but you, you're taught all sorts of nonsense in school. History and geography and algebra and calculus and trigonometry and all that stuff. Yeah, you know, they, they're trying to make you a PhD in, in next to no time. And that sort of suppresses this liking for uh, animals. It doesn't go away. There are these embers there, burning embers for example. And it just requires a tiny spark to set it, set it off again. So what really so, was that tiny spark that got you into For me, unfortunately, it never died down. Because huh? when I was in third standard, I got diphtheria. Ah. Which is fortunate. And those days, when you get diphtheria, you're supposed to lie in bed for six weeks, not move out. Because of the fear of some, I don't know, some myocarditis or something. I have no idea what, what the, the physicians talk about. So I, I was in bed. And that time I picked up this book on, uh, by Jim Corbett. And ah, read that. Yes. And read, of course, also the Mahabharata and Ramayana, which again, I think... Um, they went into uh, the Vivas, is it? Yeah. <laughs> no, no they, they play an important role okay. in, in, in shaping your life. Okay. But this stayed with me. But until I was 40, I wasn't able to afford a camera. So I was 40 years old when I bought my first camera. So what was so that first camera? That was uh, uh, a Minolta. Oh a yeah, Minolta. those, those days, days, Minolta. And, Minolta. And, and Minolta actually yeah. was apparently the first camera SLR that came camera, out with an autofocus. Okay. Uh, and uh, it was called XI and 7XI, that is extra intelligence or whatever it is. Like XI that stood for. So I went and bought that. And later on, of course, went to Canon and so on. But those days were all film uh, days. I remember going in 2007 to Kenya and taking 45 rolls of film with me. You know, 45 rolls. I then had got a, my first digital camera, which I gave to my son. You know, he will do the, the digital camera stuff, you know. And I'll take, take the, the professional, yeah. the rolls and all that. When we came back, his, his images better. were better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> That's when I said, no, no, no. Digital is the way to go. So... <laughs> I went digital from there, 2007. 2007, okay. So is your son also into uh, wildlife photography? Yeah, they both are, uh, two sons, but you know, they are, at this age, you can't really set aside that kind of time. I was able to, partly because of my passion and partly because I was fortunate to be a transplant surgeon. I know, so you, know, you, you can dictate your time. Yeah, you, patients can stay alive on dialysis. It's not an emergency all the time. That's so true. I would tell my patients, you know, stay alive on dialysis, you know, don't give up I'm on me. Out. I'm going out, I'll be back again. So, and yeah, they are blind. <laughs> and you know, you could actually dictate your time and everyone would wait. And therefore, you never compromised on the quality and neither did you compromise on your hobby, which is very rare. So, some interesting incidents when you went out and uh, the unforgetting moments in wildlife. There are wonderful moments, there are thrilling moments, there are some dangerous moments as yeah, well. Yeah, I would love to. Oh, no. <laughs> That's no. what Now, for example, I would like you to tell me about the BBC award that you got. Ah, and yeah. you were sitting there in the jeep and then you saw this leopard. Oh, seeing a leopard is itself going to be a very, you know, rare sight. Now, yeah. Tell me what you felt and how did it go? Yeah, like I said, see, 2007 I got my first digital camera, right? This, this happened in 2008. And uh, we were sitting, my family and I, sitting in this jeep, open jeep in, in Kabini. You know, those days it was open jeep. You don't have this contraption that you have now, a very ugly contraption, if I might say so. Uh, it was an open jeep with these gypsies. We went there and then my driver said, Sir, leopardo, leopardo. I looked there in that direction. Cricket pitch distance away, 22 yards away. Lovely female leopard, so graceful. In the way only uh, leopards can be, you know. Sitting on this tree. And she's sitting there with her tail sort of draping down along the, the side of the tree. And only the face is seen in between some branches. Nice clear sighting. And I was taking photographs. I took photos of the face and, you know, various emotions. Yawning, licking herself and all that stuff. Then I wanted to take the entire thing. So I turned the camera around to the vertical format. Vertical. So that I could get the entire thing. The, the body, the, the head and, and the tail. And those days, uh, the vehicles were in radio contact with one another. It, that's unfortunately not there anymore. 
our driver uh, rang up and or at least called up and said there's a leopard on a tree. So that is an exciting moment because like I said leopards are very very rare and those days very very rare. Nowadays they become so common in fact number of people see leopards. Yeah. You go to Hampi people going for a walk in the morning they constantly come across leopards out there. Anyway those days were, was, wasn't like that. So this other jeep came with the tourists there. Came rushing in, screeched to a halt, lot of dust flying, sound of brakes, everything. And that leopard got scared and ran down. Fortunately for me, I mean, this is, these are all divine interventions, right? I was like that in the vertical format. I was able to get the leopard as she, she ran vertically down the tree. Wow. It was like, you know. The entire focus was yeah, on it the It was like, you know, animal. like mercury sort of flowing down. It, it's, it was so graceful. She just flowed down the tree like that. And I followed it and did what is called a, a vertical panning which is supposed to be difficult to do. Anyway, I, I got it right and the leopard is in sharp focus, the background is blurred and the BBC liked it, I sent it off to them. At that moment, I remember cursing this other driver saying, you know, why couldn't you have come slowly, the leopard is run away now and all that, you know. Of course, cursing to myself, I didn't say it out <laughs> loud. <laughs> but because of them, I got the shot. I know. So, you know, you should never curse, <laughs> even internally, <laughs> because something good can happen out of all this. And, and it did. So, anyway, like I said, BBC liked it and I was called to London and received so, but that how award. how do you know how to prepare to enter a contest like BBC? No idea, absolutely. Then how did you manage? No idea. I did not know what a competition the, was, didn't know what BBC. Viewers? Please tell the viewers. Yeah, there was this, uh, there still is this website called indianaturewatch.net or inw.net, indianaturewatch.net. And a number of photographers at that time, in 2007, 8, 9, 10 at least, lots of all the great names in photography now, you know, in, in, in India, they would all post their images there. It was only meant for wildlife of India, not taken anywhere outside India. And when I posted this image, one of my friends from Midras, he wrote this comment on that saying, you must enter this in the BBC contest. I said, what is the BBC contest? Then I looked it up, BBC Wildlife Photographer of the Year. Didn't know how to prepare it. So called up another friend of mine and he said, you know, these are the steps that you need to take and then you need to process it. Then I said, no, this is getting serious. I better read that. So I started buying books and then, you know, online and so on. And then I self-taught on what post-processing as it's called now, what it all is, is about and how to go about processing an image for an exhibition, for a salon as it's called. So I sent it off. My very first contest that I ever entered in my life and it got this you know, one of award. The, the awards that people will give an arm and a leg for. Absolutely. <laughs> How was that feeling? Uh, it's so thrilling. I mean, you, you, you can't, there's no way you can describe it. It's I, right out of the blue. Uh, in the month of March, they said your image has been uh, sort of picked for the final judging. So we want the raw image. That is raw image is the original image untouched in, in the camera. They want to know how much of modifications you've done because that's not allowed. You can't take a sort of branch out, you can't put something else in, you can't add a flower here, all nothing, no modifications at all. You can sort of just work on the image and make it more presentable, that's it. And they have lots of don'ts, very few do's. So they want the original image to see whether I had actually taken it and whether how much of it I had cropped. If you take a large image and you crop it down to small size, you can't then enlarge it again because it becomes too grainy. And that's what they want to do in their uh, salons, in, the, in those exhibitions. So I sent that off and that matched and they said, okay, in the month of May, suddenly I got this email, just opened that and it's been selected and you won this award. I said, oh, fantastic, great. Come over in October, so we're sending you these two free tickets and a free stay in this hotel. So I went there and amazing, absolutely amazing. So how was that experience in that hotel? You went there. And and who came with you? Meda came with you? Oh, my wife was supposed to come, but then, you know, my son was very eager, my older son, uh, Vikram. So I said, okay, fine. And she said, let take him along. So I took him along. The two of us went there. It's a, you know, four or five day event. It, yes. It's like our Indian marriages. It goes on and on and on. Every day there's something new. And uh, the presentation, that is a fabulous uh, place. The Natural History Museum yes, in, in yes. London. It's great. It, it's so much history there. And, you know, the, the old stone building and all that. Next to that is this very, very modern David Attenborough studio, which is all aluminium and glass and steel and it's terrible. It, it doesn't gel at all with this. But I'm glad to say I was one of the first speakers in the David Attenborough studio. As part of this, two people were chosen and I was one of those people who presented my 
images from India in the David Attenborough studio. One of the first few, in fact. I think it was inaugurated in August and I, I gave my talk in October. So, like I said, very, very, thick, uh, very new. But in this, coming back to this room, there's this huge hall where there was a massive uh, fossil of a dinosaur called uh, Diplodocus. And they used to call her, they said, they named her uh, her, the, this uh, fossil. Diplodocus, they called her Dippy. So Dippy was hanging over us in this massive hall. And, uh, and, and the way the Britishers can do it, you know, they, they carry everything off with great aplomb and uh, great style, a lot of character and everything. So it, it's a fabulous moment. Then after that came the day where all these photographs are exhibited in the, in the museum and people are let in. The first day is all royalty and so on and those with passes and then the next day the general public who buy tickets buy and tickets actually and buy come. tickets and come and watch this and wow. that goes on for about I think two or three months that exhibition goes on okay. and then it's taken around the world and then show. So yeah, this was fantastic. So, it was a great experience really. And any of the comments from the you know people who've come and paid for those tickets and uh, uh, did this Anything touch you? You know, what, what you are supposed to do is you stand next to the, this image mm. and that image is uh, backlit so okay. people can see it. It's, it's very, very nice, very nicely done. And people come up there and then they ask you questions and you are supposed to answer how you took the image and what the setting was and so on. But this moment I will never forget because uh, <laughs> I will become emotional at this moment. <laughs> 